you to um, NEDIC's uh, second quarterly webinar of the year. Um, and I'm very happy today to be welcoming Jay Walker, who is a NEDIC volunteer and a personal trainer. Um, he spoke at our most recent conference on body image and self-esteem and um, was, uh, was greeted with a very receptive audience there. He is a personal trainer who has recovered from an eating disorder. Jay brings a really unique perspective to his work in body image and fitness. Um, he's a regular contributor and coordinator for the Netic blog. Um, and Jay also spoke publicly this year his recovery for Bell Let's Talk Day um, on Much Music. Jay hopes to help people understand how the fitness industry can impact men's relationships with their bodies challenging misconceptions about health and recovery along the way. And Jay also said this webinar will help people in recovery or those with a loved one dealing with an eating disorder. Um, so if anyone has any issues um, with audio, with seeing the slides, please let us know. Um, we'll be sure to get a copy of the slides and the recording out to everyone who registered for the webinar. Um, and in the meantime, if you do have any issues, um, feel free to let us know. If you have any questions um, for Jay, please type them in the chat box and uh, we will put up and uh, get to them as we go along. So I will now hand it over to Jay. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to uh, listening to my spiel. Anyway, let's uh, get started. So background to me. My name is Jay Walker. I work in health and fitness. Uh, I got my diploma in uh, fitness and lifestyle management from George Brown College and I also did a BA in honors uh, in English and Aboriginal studies at Trent U. Um, to sum up, I'm someone who needing eating disorder and I like to talk about how much better my life has become without it. Um, and that's kind of what my career revolves around. So Let's talk a little bit about what dis uh, eating disorders are. Um, so to start off, this does not define um, every case of an eating disorder. disorder. Um, there's all sorts of behaviors. These are the ones that we talked about. Um, so anorexia, uh, which is a restriction of food intake, uh, which is a pattern of binging on food, followed by a period of pur purging, uh, most often, but also not limited to vomiting or exercise. Um, binge eating disorder, uh, eating large quantities of food, often to the point of physical discomfort, and muscle dysmorphia, which there's a new trend uh, where everyone's calling it big orexia, so an obsession with not being big or muscular enough. So what's really important here is that um, we can't really classify people as having necessarily one. Um, of these disorders. Um, there's been a lot of overlap uh, or, or crossover um, and the behaviors can be quite mild or very severe um, and sometimes vary in patterns back and forth. Uh, regardless, what we want to talk about today is um, identification and intervention. So. How and why are men affected? So estimates range that 10 to 25 percent of people with eating disorders are men. Uh, the statistic I provide is from a range of information um, coming from Netic, coming from NIDA, um, but that is the general range that I have found for myself. Now that having been said, these are reported cases, um, and unfortunately. A lot of people, both men and women um, with eating disorders, um, do not come forward and talk about these things. So this is just to give us a bit of background. Um, the issues are usually about self-esteem, uh, body image, uh, self-worth, and stress coping mechanisms. Um, the issues to talk about today, um, although we outline them for men, they can be similar to or different than those of women. Um, and again, 
not, neither of the issues will be exclusive to um, any gender. Um, what we are noticing is that there's more and more social pressure in the media uh, to fit into a certain look than ever before, so sort of defining what it is to be a man. Uh, the pressure is generally to be muscular, lean, tall, financially successful, and very much in control, uh, most often of emotions. Um, and it's something that we sort of summed up as being called uh, Superman or perfection. Um, again, we're not at every issue here. Person's issues are individual. These are common factors that we present. Same thing with media. Um, media is not necessarily the reason why someone has an eating disorder, but it can often be a negative influence. Alrighty. What I want to talk to you guys about is why these issues a lot of the time go unnoticed. Um, part of it, I believe, is that because the look, and again, this is not exclusive, but uh, it often emphasizes muscle, muscle definition and an extremely low body fat rather than being thin. Um, exercise, again, is usually a component, but not exclusive. And this can also be seen as, in uh, women as well, often as a form of a purging mechanism. Um, and the thing about exercise is we associate it with health promotion because for a lot of people, exercise is healthy. Uh, more size, though, does not always mean better health. Um, and we can't really well gym goers being healthy, healthy. Again, it's very individualized. Um, we can't define who has or does not have an eating disorder um, by visuals. It's much more defined by behavior. Um, another one to touch on is that um, supplements and steroids are also used generally a little bit more in men. Um, and they are quite common. They're not hard to get your hands on. Um, and by the everyday gym goer, they can be uh, easily accessed. So I had a few of you guys send in questions about um, like touching on the topic of steroid use and supplements. So we're not going to get too, too heavy into it. But um, steroid use in a working out environment are generally anabolic steroids. So these are drugs that have very similar effects to testosterone in the body, just at, at an elevated level. Um, this is not limited. Like they're, they're only limited use, but these are generally the ones that are most commonly used. Um, besides Side effects are increased aggression, mania, depression, and paranoia, to name a few. Um, and the level varies with each person. Some people will do a cycle and they will not experience these. Some people will and they will experience them tenfold. Um, very, very individualized. Um, Supplements, very different from steroids. Uh, they vary widely in type. Some of them are quite safe and some are not. Common supplements, um, like outer gym setting, are protein powders, shakes, uh, creatine, meal replacements. Um, and again, some, some of these things are quite safe, used moderately. Some are not. Um, I highly, highly recommend talking to a health professional, someone you trust, or even a doctor before using any of these products. Um, and what you need to remember is if you go to purchase them is that people are making money off of you. So companies or salespeople are going to tell you all the benefits and not necessarily the drawbacks. Again, very, very individualized. Um, so to, to move on, I do want to talk about the benefits of health and fitness um, and working in the industry as far as uh, 
eating disorders go. So the, so the fitness industry uh, influence. Um, I just want to premise this by I love my industry and um, I love working out, I love getting people to work out. So I want to start off with the positive because there's a lot of positive out there. Um, so physical benefits, I mean heart, the health of your heart and your lung density, posture, reducing all types of body and back pain, these are all back pain, these are all benefits that we can get from physical exercise. Um, improving your self-image, a lot of people when they start to work out or do any type of different physical activity, um, they get to take pride in their accomplishments. Um, increasing mental and physical energy. Um, there's something to be said about expending some physical energy and then getting some good rest, getting on what a lot of people would call a healthy cycle. Um, aiding in stress management. For a lot of people, myself included, um, expending, you know, now that I've got a good relationship with my body can uh, deal with stress in positive ways. Uh, what's important we educate us to get there. Um, and then again, experiencing your body's abilities. This sort of um, not necessarily working out for physical self but what we can do. Um, acquiring new skills. So a lot of these skills can relate to real life. So for some people had issues with mobility, doing a lot of training can help that. Getting up is getting into and out of certain things. Um, so uh, the nitty gritty of the negative part of the fitness industry, this I or I'm hoping to be changing, is that um, our advertising often gives a very false idea of what healthy is or what it means. Um, we are really bad at advertising that thin muscles, high fitness level, that these are key indicators of health. We really promote um, physique over health, and that's not the case. Real health is feeling good. Um, all those medical tests that we can have done about our blood, our heart, our lungs to uh, see, see if we are actually healthy. That's much more an indicator of health, encompassing physical, mental, emotional, and for a lot of people, spiritual well being. We often use images of athletes, uh, fitness models, high-end competitors, and while I don't think having in the picture is necessarily a bad thing, we're really bad at not showing the
everyday person, you know, reinforce eating a wide variety of food and intuitive eating. Listening to your body. Uh, listening again, listen to your clients. Um, create an environment where they can really talk to you. So eye contact, taking notes, and doing a lot of follow-up. If the client shares with you something that they're feeling, uh, they may not want to talk about it right then. Next session, follow up with them. Okay. And then this is the big one, is referrals. Um, it's really important to have a set of specialists in your area to refer your clients to. Just like you would if a client was injured, you would refer them to a chiropractor or a physiotherapist or a medical doctor or whatnot. Um, I think it's really important to get yourself connected and have a wide net um, therapist or, uh, yeah, I guess therapist to be able to refer them to. Because as much as um, we can inform ourselves, we are not necessarily able to help our clients with those particular issues. It's great for us to have the information, but you know, at some point we have to be able to hand them off to someone who can really help them. <sighs> okay, parents, for any parents out there, because um, you know, as someone who went through an eating disorder, I know what my uh, <laughs> what my poor parents went through. Um, so, what can you do as a parent? Unfortunately, I'd love to tell you that you can fix everything, but um, ultimately, it ends up being uh, on a journey that they have to go through. Um, we can do certain things, I think, to set up our children for success, though. So the big number one, uh, focusing on non-physical children, praising their actions, their actions they do. Um, you know, and I'm not saying don't tell your kids that they're handsome or more beautiful or whatever number of terms you might want to use to describe them, but, um, you know, let them know that Stuff like beauty is not just an external quality. Um, encouraging them to try different sports as well as uh, hobbies involving the body and stuff that doesn't involve the body, more so the mind. Um, I see children all the time who, especially competitive, they are really pressured into different sports. By their parents, and you know it's painful when you see children who really aren't enjoying what they're doing. Feel that they have to, and I think that kind of um, sets up a stand that uh, often doesn't play very healthy. Um, you know, if if a child tells you that they aren't enjoying something that you're doing, experience something else, um, and then discussing feelings, self-esteem, values, um, especially values, um, so that you know you know kids are set up the idea to view. Um, values that is very physical and uh, it's to outline um, in the home provide a wide range of food um, have them try everything I think getting kids convincing them to try everything at least once is really important um, I think it can set up a very open attitude but if they don't enjoy something you know, if they've tried them, don't force them to finish it. Um, and then I really want to talk about eating big meals together often because I think there's so, so, so many benefits to this. In eating meals together, I think it's really, really important to encourage intuitive eating. So just to bring it back to what I was saying before, um, you know, as babies, we're hungry, we cry, we're full, we turn our heads away. A skill that a lot of us seem to lose. So, you know, if a child comes to you, you know, a half hour before dinner and says, I'm really, really hungry, you know, encourage them to choose a little something to eat to tide them over. Um, and if during dinner they say they're full, let them stop eating. Um, I really feel that from a 
a very young age, we can encourage children on an unconscious level to kind of disassociate themselves with hungry um, by forcing them to finish your food when they're already saying they're full. We sort of lose us to be hungry, content. Um, if you are concerned about an eating disorder, a child, a teen, or your child who happens to be an adult, um, I think it's really important to approach from a very caring place without accusation. And if your child pushes back, if there is resistance, um, um, don't keep pushing. Um, let them know that you are open to talking about it. Um, keep that open dialogue. Um, and I, I think it's very important to focus on how they're feeling, not so much focusing on the behavior around food. Um, and from a very young age, I think it's important to, to let your kids know that we all have insecurity. And it's a matter of finding healthy ways to deal with them. Um, yeah. So we talk about what what is recovery. This is a question I get a lot. Um, <laughs> and again, much like an eating disorder, it's a big gray area. It doesn't mean um, never having a body image concern. Is the next thing is that thought is, um, and it, it it doesn't mean ever not having and insecurity again. I think what, what it means is not letting those concerns define you or control what you do. Um, for example, I think it's the difference between having negative feelings about yourself on the rise and, and having those feelings actually control your behavior around food and exercise. The fact is, life throws negative stuff at you, so you're more to deal with them. Um, it's the difference checking your image in the morning before you head out the door, make sure you're clean and prep and uh, checking your image every time there's a reflective surface to make sure you haven't gained or lost weight or you still look okay. Um, I think it's a matter of being able to sit down with people or alone and eat a meal and enjoy it without concern, stress, or um, anxiety. I think it's about regaining energy to really take all the other great aspects of life in. So how do people recover? Um, again, I just would like to emphasize that recovery uh, paths to recovery are not limited to what I'm outlining. These are the, I guess, most common ones and the ones that I refer people to. Um, therapy, so one-on-one -on -one and group therapy are quite common. One-on-one -on -one is often about tackling individual, personal, emotional, mental, psychological issues. Um, a lot of group therapy can be about finding community and support, um, talking about um, management of stress and behavioral strategies, um, what to do after a relapse in behavior, um, finding other people to talk to. Uh, medical intervention can be an option in severe cases, um, usually through a hospital setting. Um, Behavioral modification practices, so coping strategies, um, behavior, yes, coping strategies, um, to analyze your behavior and figure out why you're doing what you're doing and uh, talking with psychologists or psychotherapists about changing those patterns of behavior um, to more healthy ones. Um, nutritional and exercise counseling. And that's where the fitness professional can hopefully come into play. Um, or speaking with a holistic nutritionist who also hopefully has a background with the fact that the issues are so much deeper than the actual food themselves. Um, and really, it all 
comes down, I think, to discovering new and healthy ways to deal with these stresses and these feelings. And I want to reiterate that recovery happens um, at people's own paces. It is very individualized. For some people, it can be a long process. For some people, it can be a bit of a shorter one. I think the thing about recovery is that it's it can be continuous. Um, I think even though you've been in behaviors for years, there's still things now that I'm learning about myself that tie into what I would consider my recovery process. So yes, at their own pace. Um, and just a, a closing word to anyone who might be watching this, who they themselves have any of these feelings. Uh, recover. Absolutely, you can, can recover. It's work, but you can do it. Um, if you're seeking a personal trainer, ask a million questions, many as you want. Uh, it's important. Um, ask about background, education, anything and everything else. Um, in working with therapists, if one doesn't fit for you, don't feel defeated. Um, there's always that human element 